Braves and baseball fans, it's time to take a trip from coast to coast across Major League Baseball. There it goes, a long drive. If it stays fair, home run. One strike away. Sandy into his windup. Here's the pitch. Swung on and missed a perfect game. Fly ball deep left center. Grissom on the run. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Champion Jeff, listen to this crowd. Left side, Swanson to first. Braves, world champions. Braves and baseball talk, straight from the diamond. Here's Grant McCauley. And hello and welcome to From the Diamond here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Grant McCauley with you from the Kia Studios on a Sunday evening. As we wrap up the weekend... And, of course, the week that was for the Atlanta Braves, by and large, it was a very successful week for this Braves club. They got things going way, way, way back on Sunday. Yeah, we had a Sunday morning edition of the show last week, and then the Braves went out and had an epic comeback, a go-ahead grand slam by Eddie Rosario to help take two out of three from the Arizona Diamondbacks. we got a lot to talk about when it comes to the comeback victories that just kept on coming. Right after that, there were three of them against the New York Mets, another against the Washington Nationals, Three consecutive series victories, and it seems like the tone has completely shifted inside of a week when we last spoke here on 92.9 The Game, and we were talking about, was this going to be kind of a letdown heading into the month of June for the Braves? They lost two out of three to the Oakland Athletics. Who does that? Well, not too many teams, but as it turns out, the Braves and the Rangers both share that, and the Rangers are one of the clubs, one of the only two clubs, with a better record in all of baseball than the Atlanta Braves. So uh, I guess you can file it under a broken clock, is right twice a day, or blind squirrel, whatever you want to call it. But the Braves were able to turn things around, and that's been something this club has done incredibly well over the years, is just find a way to move on to the next day, turn the page, and not let things linger for too terribly long, and they did a pretty nice job of that. The Arizona Diamondbacks, a very, very good team. Braves took two out of three from them, and then they came on home and got an off day on Monday. Then they ran through the New York Mets three consecutive nights, three consecutive comebacks, just an epic series for the Atlanta Braves, and it was capped off by something we're going to get to enjoy a little bit more And that was a players-only television broadcast that happened on Thursday night with Chipper Jones, Tom Glavin, Jeff Francoeur, and John Smoltz all sharing the booth and giving us the kind of entertainment that I I know we all expected there to be a lot of fun with that broadcast, but uh, far and away. And the game was a big help, too. The Braves walked off 13-10 to in 10 innings. That didn't hurt either, but it was just an awful lot of fun. You're going to hear from a couple of guys that were part of that broadcast on today's show. I caught up with Tom Glavin and with Jeff Francoeur this week at Truist Park. So we'll let you hear from them as we talk a little bit more about that as the show goes on. And, of course, we've got a lot of other things jam-packed into this edition of the show. And we'll get things started here with a little bit of Braves discussion momentarily. But I want to remind you, as always, if you're new to From the Diamond, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find it on the Odyssey app. If you want to connect on social media, you can find me on Twitter. I am at Grant McCauley there. I am also at Grant McCauley on Instagram. You can find the show on Instagram and on Twitter at From the Diamond is where you can find that. An underscore on the end for the one on Twitter. Like the show on Facebook, and if you need links to any or all of that, just head on over to FromTheDiamond.com, and you can get those right there. Additionally, on this show, it's not just going to be about the Atlanta Braves, as we always like to take a look at what else is happening around the world of baseball, take our trip around the big leagues, as it were. I'm really excited about the guest that's going to join me in the second hour. That is Lindsay Barra. She is the granddaughter of baseball great Hall of Famer Yogi Berra who I think a lot of people might know more about Yogi as far as his personality is concerned than maybe the playing career of the man, who, again, is in the Hall of Fame. Won 10 rings with the New York Yankees during his playing days, won a few more on some coaching staffs, but I think that Yogi the person has become this larger-than-life transcendent figure, and it might actually keep people from realizing just how great he was on the field. Well, there's a brand-new documentary that's out called It Ain't Over, I think that you're going to really enjoy it if you love baseball history, and I'm really excited to talk to Lindsay Barra about how that came to be, about her thoughts and feelings about growing up as the granddaughter of one of the greatest baseball players of all time and one of the biggest, I think, characters in baseball history as well. So she'll join me a little bit later on in the show. We'll talk all about that, uh, the It Ain't Over documentary. But if you get a chance, it is now playing here in Atlanta or available streaming as well. So you can just go ahead and look that up, put it in your queue, and when we get done here on From the Diamond, go ahead and fire that thing up and enjoy it. As for the Braves, this was a very, very profitable week for the Atlanta club and getting themselves back on track in the way that they needed to be in the win column after the disappointment of that road trip out in Oakland where it feels like a month ago, to be honest with you, with how much and how eventful things have been. 
over the last 10 days or, or a couple of weeks. And because we were talking about the return of Michael Soroka, we'll get into that a little bit later. But that storyline kind of came and went. And then the Braves had a brand new storyline in the starting rotation. That's A.J. smith Shaver. And man, I thought he looked pretty good on Friday. We'll get into you know, how long uh, this opportunity may be there for him. Of course, the return of Max Fried at some point, Kyle Wright at some point. The Braves are anticipating getting those guys back in the fray, but somebody's got to step up. You hope that Soroka could do that, but now maybe A.J. smith Shaver is that guy. But all of that is stuff we can get to a little bit later. As far as this week was concerned, a complete 180 from that road trip recently, or at least the way the road trip started. It all began, at least the positive momentum did, by taking two out of three against the Arizona Diamondbacks. But coming home and rekindling this rivalry with the Mets, which it almost feels like not only a 180 did the Braves make in about a week's time, but this also feels like a complete 180 of where we were a year ago at this time. When the Braves marched into the month of June, they found themselves 10 and a half games out of first place in the National League East, as the Mets were just running away with things. And now the Braves find themselves, I believe, eight and a half games ahead of the New York Mets in the standings. The Mets are not even in second place. They are in fourth place, as the Phillies have passed, and the Marlins have played much better baseball this year. They're the second-place team in this division. They've been doing a lot of winning lately as well. They're keeping themselves within an arm's reach of the Braves, who do have the best record in the National League, just took two out of three from the Nationals, just swept the Mets in three games. But this National League East is just... Pretty much the complete opposite of what it was a year ago as far as the Braves are concerned. They found themselves trying to climb in the standings, trying to catch up with the New York Mets. And it took a very, very hot summer all the way into the fall and then a three-game series in October to finally overtake that club and win the National League East again last year. So suffice it to say, the division is not over. There is a lot of baseball left to be played, just under 100 games to go. But sweeping the New York Mets and continuing to turn Truist Park into what has been a house of horrors for this New York club. They were swept last year, again, in that pivotal series, September going into October. This makes seven in a row after the Braves swept them in comeback fashion in each one of those games. And that was despite the fact they had Carlos Carrasco, Max Scherzer, and Justin Verlander lined up to face the Braves. I didn't really look at this as a series where either team was going to grab a sweep. But if you were the New York Mets and you very much needed to take two out of three, You had it lined up the way that you wanted to. You took a lead in each one of these games, but for New York, they weren't able to hold on to any of those leads. And in one of those games in particular, we kind of got our new bulletin board material. A year ago, it was a New York broadcaster by the name of Sal Licata who was proclaiming that the National League East was over at the end of May. Now, having been in this business for a while and having covered baseball for a while, stranger things have happened than a crazy divisional race with over 100 games to play. I just want to throw that out there. Putting Sal off to the side, the bulletin board material came from the New York Mets dugout this time in this most recent series. Pete Alonso hit a towering home run off Bryce Elder in his last start. And I guess he really, really liked the slider that Bryce Elder was throwing. I don't really know what all led to it as far as deciding to go ahead and trash talk one of the quietest, most soft-spoken guys on the team. But Pete Alonso made a request. Throw it again. Please, please throw it again. And by the time that game was over and the Braves were done hitting their home runs and making their comeback, you had some fun chirping back and forth between these two teams. Pete Alonso started it. And then you had Tyler Matzik, some of the Braves pitchers, offering a little retort from the other dugout a little bit later in the game as the Braves did make their comeback and win that game. And then you just had a series of events that was unfortunate the next day. Charlie Morton did plunk Pete Alonso in the wrist. He has a bone bruise. He's going to be out for two to three weeks, I believe, landed on the injured list. That, though, not intentional. Charlie Morton reached out to Pete Alonso. Pete Alonso, in talking to the New York press, said, look, I don't believe it was intentional at all. Charlie Morton has come over and apologized to me, and let's just go ahead and put this issue to bed. This is not part of the back and forth we're going to have between this team. That's just the unfortunate timing of baseball. You never want to see anybody get injured, but as far as the the things that happened on the field and the results and the win column, it was the Braves finding comeback after comeback after comeback against this New York club. An absolutely crazy, crazy series. So, As I said, I think a week or so ago, as far as what the Braves could do to find the momentum that they need to hold off the rest of this division as some other teams are still kind of trying to find themselves, not just the Mets, but also the Phillies. Again, the Marlins have played pretty well, but I said you don't necessarily have to win 14 in a row like you did a year ago, but it wouldn't hurt. Well, the Braves went ahead and reeled off a seven-game winning streak, including the two against Arizona, three against the Mets, and the first two against the Washington Nationals before losing by a 6-2 score on Sunday. Seven-game win streak will work. Maybe you can win 14 out of 15. I don't know. Whatever the math is, we'll see what the Braves can do. They're going to head out to Detroit. Then they're going to welcome the Colorado Rockies. So the schedule on paper, and again, I can't stress it enough, on paper, it does look pretty favorable for the Braves over this next week. But 
you got to go out, you got to play the games, you got to grab those wins as many as you can. But a very, very intriguing series between the Braves and the Mets. And again, this Truist Park place for the New York Mets has not been a whole lot of fun for them. They have lost seven in a row at Truist Park. Three of the biggest games that were played between the two teams last year that decided the division and this recent three-game series. And then you get a little bit more of that back and forth between these two teams, and we'll see how it all plays out. Ultimately, you know that if you go through a series and something happens on the field and it ends up on a couple of T-shirts by the time that the series is over, you've probably had some pretty eventful baseball, and the Braves most certainly had that. On Thursday, the excitement that was involved with Ozzie Albies hitting the walk-off home run in the 10th inning, Orlando Arcia sent it to extra innings with his home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. What a crazy game. Maybe the wildest game of this year and one of the wildest games I can think of in recent Braves history. There have been some crazy ones. Um, the 29-9 to game against the Miami Marlins may always hold the number one distinction as far as just wild and crazy game. Not necessarily the biggest and most important game, but I don't know how too many times I'm going to watch a baseball team score 29 runs. That was a, a little bit of fun. That was a couple of years ago now, though. But this one, coming back, and just throwing all of the expectations that Spencer Strider versus Justin Verlander was supposed to have, and those guys were done after the fourth inning. Spencer Strider was done after three innings. Justin Verlander was done. And by the time we got to the 10th, the Braves were getting that dramatic walk-off. For the fourth consecutive day, they were able to pick up a walk-off win. we got a lot more to talk about here on From the Diamond as we roll on and discuss things going on for the Braves this week. We have got a lot of dominance against the National League East that the Braves have been able to pull off this year. That's a big reason for their success. What have been the underlying, I guess, uh, reasons maybe baked into the club's good start here in the month of June. A little bit of offense, a little bit of work by the bullpen. We're going to talk all about that. It's from the Diamond with Grant McCauley. Continues right here on 92.9 The Game. Take a look around the league with more of our From the Diamond on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. This is From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Live from the Kia Studios in Midtown as we Put the finishing touches on the weekend, get you set for the next week's worth of Braves baseball, but we can't do that before we recap the week that was for the Braves, and it was quite a good one. Sweep of the New York Mets, two out of three from the Arizona Diamondbacks in the weekend leading into that, and of course, two out of three against the Washington Nationals. We'll love that sweep. Nationals' last place club in the NL East, but uh, the Braves were unable to find the runs they needed behind Bryce Elder, who ran into a little middle-inning trouble, and there was no rally to be found on Sunday. But the Braves did take two out of three, again, to winning a series is always what you want to do every time you walk into any three- or four-game set. Those will add up by the time you get to the end of the year, and the Braves have won three consecutive series after losing two out of three to the Oakland Athletics. And so as the Braves beat up on the rest of the National League East this year, you might want to take note of some trends that are really baked into Atlanta's success in this division. Braves are now 17-6 and six against the rest of the National League East and have outscored, and at least opponents, 148-91. to 91 through Sunday. So by my count, that's a run differential of what? Plus 57? That, as they say, will play. And the Braves, they've shown it. They are a team that knows how to score runs. The offense is going to be a big driving force of this team, particularly when we've had to talk about so much pitching injury and attrition that the Braves have dealt with this year. Different guys have been challenged to step into different roles. It has been, I think, at times very taxing on the bullpen. The starting rotation most certainly has been taxed as well this year. And it does put a lot of pressure on the lineup to come out and produce. And on nights that you do score five, six, seven runs, you do want to feel like you got a chance to win that game. And more times than not, of course, the Braves do. And I could point to their overall record being the best in the National League to let you know that this is a team that is far more good than bad. But they've had more success this year, and I think surprisingly so, considering the things that have not gone right for them. And every club, all the injuries, they're not just Atlanta's. Everybody's got them. But it's been surprising to see this amount of success when you kind of flash back to a year ago and it was a much healthier Braves team, I feel like, in my memory. And maybe I can go back and find a couple of injuries that were there. But you didn't have Max Reed and Kyle Wright certainly on the injured list for big chunks of the season. And they're going to be out for even longer. You didn't lose your starting shortstop for three, three and a half weeks to a micro fracture in his left wrist. That didn't happen. You didn't lose your all-star catcher for close to a month with a concussion last year that I remember. You also did not lose your center fielder for three, three and a half weeks due to a bad back. And all of these things are happening concurrently. And there are other injuries, you know, mixed in all of this. Rysel Iglesias beginning the year on the IL, not available at the back end of that bullpen. That immediately was something that would create a problem for most clubs when you don't have your closer. It just changes the whole dynamic of the bullpen. But Atlanta has been able to, I think, find ways to really tap into the resiliency of 
that club and that culture. And I've been asked a lot over the past week, particularly with the head-to-head against the New York Mets. And I know a lot of people in Braves country take a lot of satisfaction, might be the word, out of the Mets' struggles. They have a team that on paper is very talented. They're hanging around 500 right now. Doesn't mean that they don't have a run in them at some point this year to make things a little bit more interesting this season. But coming in and getting swept by the Braves in the fashion in which they were, with a little bit of trash talk early on, and then uh, the Braves kind of doing their talking with the bats in the late innings and coming back to win three consecutive nights and cap it with an epic walk-off and a 13-10 to victory to finish off a sweep of New York, that kind of sent a message. So it was very quizzical, I think, to hear Buck Showalter talking about, and that, I don't know what you say, I mean, you certainly can't just sit there and throw every player or a whole bunch of individuals under the bus for not being able to come through for you because I think they know you know, who or where or when things did not go the way that they wanted them to, and the bullpen is a big example of that. But for Buck Showalter to come out of that series saying, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of the way these guys competed, I'd be a little more proud if they were able to finish off some of these wins, at least one of these wins. And Buck was managing that third game like it was Game 7 of the World Series. We had pitching change after pitching change, which, of course, with Justin Verlander being done after three innings, you knew New York was going to have to go through the bullpen anyway. But you know, the Braves were tying it. And the ninth inning off David Robertson walking it off against Tommy Hunter. He was designated for assignment after that. But the reactions of both of these guys, I saw a tweet earlier this week. I don't know who, who put it up, but it was screenshots of David Robertson been over on the mound, kind of hunched down, looking at the ground after giving up the Orlando Arcia home run in the ninth inning on Thursday. And then you had Tommy Hunter just losing his cool when he grooved the pitch to Ozzie Albies that went over the right field wall for the Braves win. And I don't blame him. That's not a good feeling whatsoever. But just very strange, I felt like, to see kind of where the Mets are considering not only the expectations for them, not only the payroll for them, but I feel like at some point they should be a better team than they have been this year, closer to what they were a year ago. But there are some definite holes. They have not gotten good starting pitching. Their bullpen has been, if you want to look at problematic bullpens, the Braves have gotten off easy when you compare it to what's been going on with the New York Mets this year, most certainly. Uh, But the Braves' offense, as I mentioned, is something that's going to be a driving force for this team. And Atlanta has been, I think, the best offense, at least in the National League this month, and one of the best in baseball. Coming into Sunday, this month, the Braves are batting 316 with 15 home runs, both top totals in Major League Baseball, and averaging 6.25 runs per game that leads the National League. Now, we're not that far into the month of June, but we're about a third of the way through. And so small sample size notwithstanding, definitely notable, and a big reason why the Braves were just able to reel off that seven-game winning streak is offensive totals like that, particularly when you think about how things were wrapping up in the month of May when they couldn't figure out how to score some runs against the Oakland Athletics of all teams. So this is a good trend, and the Braves have shown that they can find these runs and find them at the right time and win some baseball games. But put that together with, I think, a resurgent Atlanta bullpen, which has been, I don't know that we've spent any more time on any more topic, maybe injuries, but any one position group more so than the bullpen. Because every time you let a lead go, you kind of look, at the bullpen and say, hey, what happened? You lost us the game, and that goes with the territory. Most relievers know that. But if you look at the bigger picture, there are some nights where, hey, you left eight or ten guys on base. That contributed there. Maybe the starter didn't get as deep into the game as you wanted him to, and that's kind of seemed to be the problem and where the Braves were not too long ago, about three weeks ago in the month of May, where you didn't have Freed, you didn't have Wright. You you were trying to figure out if Jared Schuster was going to work. They were still trotting out Dylan Dodd. You had Michael Soroka come back briefly. And then now A.J. smith Shaver's in this mix as well, but you had Bryce Elder, Spencer Strider, and Charlie Morton kind of carrying this rotation, but the bullpen was being asked to throw a trio of bullpen games, and I think that that experiment might have done more harm than good to the overall performance of the Atlanta bullpen for several days after each one of those. But the bullpen now, with a much more, I think, stable starting five, with again, Strider, Morton, and Elder, and then adding in what Jared Schuster has done, and we'll see what A.J. smith Shaver is able to add to this mix as well, Entering Sunday's game, the Atlanta bullpen had a 119 ERA in 30 and a third innings so far this June. A 119 ERA is the best in Major League Baseball this month. They allowed just 16 hits across 25 appearances, and that's the fewest in the National League. So I do think we're starting to see these come together. We've seen A.J. Minter pitching a lot better of late. I know he gave up a home run. It was I, I felt like a, just a really good job of hitting by Gavin Stone, but a home run's a home run. But that broke a 6 outing scoreless streak for A.J. Minter, you got to get him on track. And I think he's getting on track. Joe Jimenez has also looked like he's getting on track. Colin McHugh, you know, healthy and able to contribute here again. 
Rysel Iglesias had a couple of rocky outings. And we looked at those bullpen games. The reason they lost a couple of them, or one of the reasons, was Iglesias got a little roughed up. The offense didn't hit well in the first one, but a blown save in that one in Toronto in particular, you could look at that as kind of a missed opportunity. And the closer's going to have it laid at his feet a lot of times. But as we know, it takes a team to win. It also takes a team to lose on most days as well. But you need the bullpen to be able to you know, have the rest that it needs. You try to manage through you know, the workloads of all these different relievers. But I do think that they're starting to turn the corner there in that relief group, and that's going to be a big deal. And the Braves have had some challenges in that bullpen, but that is no different than the 29 other teams across baseball. Everybody's going to go through it. When you talk about success in the bullpen, though, I think there's one name that has, at least this weekend, kind of reached the very height of popularity. He'd be a trending topic in the Braves' bullpen. That's Jesse Chavez, 39 years old. On his fourth go-round with the Atlanta Braves, he came back in 2021, was part of the World Series team, kind of gained a, a cult following at that point because he has some really nice headwear. Really, really nice headwear. And he sported it not only in the parade, but also in the trip to the White House last year. Jesse came back in 2022. He ended up being traded in the deal to the Angels to get Rysel Iglesias. And a few weeks later, the Angels decided, well, eh, we're going to cut our losses here. Let Jesse Chavez go. He came right on back to the Atlanta Braves, where he proceeded to pick up right where he left off like nothing had happened and be a credible, strong member of that bullpen. And then he signed a minor league deal to come back in 2023, made the club out of spring training. And I think that if you're looking at a lot of the numbers, just the good old-fashioned numbers and what he's been doing, he may be the Braves' best reliever this year, and it may not be particularly close. And it's a crazy thing to say about a veteran, a journeyman, the most traded player in baseball history at 39 years old, comes in, and with two more scoreless innings on Saturday, he lowered his ERA to 1.55. As you know, I like to follow these numbers pretty closely, so I did some digging, as I'm sure you knew that I would, to see exactly how good Jesse Chavez has been in a Braves uniform since he rejoined the club in 2021. He's just late in his career. This was one of those moves that was meant to be just some veteran depth. You know, you like the pitcher, you like the person, going to be a good fit. We'll see what he can give us, but really just meant to kind of hold the spot for a little while. And Jesse has taken that time and that opportunity and turned it into some serious results. So in four different stints with the Braves, one in 2021, two last year, and one this year, Jesse Chavez has made 106 appearances for Atlanta since 2021. He owns a 226 ERA with 34 walks and 133 strikeouts and 115 and two-thirds innings. I would not have previously defined Jesse Chavez as a strikeout pitcher, at least not to that degree. But at 39 years old, he's got a 155 ERA this year, has 13 holds, which is essentially coming in, and the save rules apply, but you're just not getting the final three outs. You're just holding a lead for your team, three runs or less. Nine walks, 36 strikeouts for him in 29 innings, opposing hitters batting under 200 against him there at 192. Now, there can be some excitement in some Jesse Chavez innings. He finds a way to maybe get into a little trouble sometimes, but he finds a way to get out of it way more times than not. He got into his own little jam a few days ago, got a couple of big strikeouts, was really pumped up, and I think that's when people started to notice, hey, maybe Jesse Chavez has been doing a little bit more heavy lifting than we realized this year because they're not using him as the chunk reliever. He's going to throw a couple of innings, maybe try to get you eight outs when the Braves are down by a 6-1 to score in the fifth inning. That, they're not using him like that. They've had to use him in leverage this year, and I think a lot of people were like, wait, how did Jesse Chavez become our leverage reliever here? Well, let me tell you. Joe Jimenez wasn't effective. Kirby Yates was not particularly effective early on. That's kind of been hit or miss there. A.J. Minter was having to close, so you could no longer use him in leverage situations before the ninth inning, and we've talked a little bit about A.J.'s struggles this year. And Rysel Iglesias was down. Well, that all of a sudden, when you have four different guys heading in four different directions, leaves you trying to find some answers in the middle innings and, and in leverage situations in the maybe sixth, seventh, eighth inning. All of a sudden, Jesse Chavez jumped in there, and he has more than done his part. I talked a little bit throughout the course of the season about unsung heroes for the Braves this year. And after a while, when you sing their praises long enough, they're no longer an unsung hero. They're just flat out a great contributor to this club. Let's go ahead and bypass the unsung hero stuff and just tell you, Jesse Chavez has been a, a guy that has really kept the bullpen together. He's been a glue piece for the club, not just with what he does on the field, but I think what he does behind the scenes with the things that he does as a veteran pitcher who has been there and done that more than anybody else, maybe save Charlie Morton in that clubhouse. But for the bullpen, for the relievers, and for the tight-knit group that they have and that they hold, this in addition to what he does on the field, that is important, is one of the most important acquisitions that you can make from a stabilizing standpoint.
and it wasn't the flashiest or the biggest of all the moves that were made over the course of the offseason. But when you know what you got sometimes, it's nice to be able to count on that guy. And Jesse Chavez has been a guy that the Braves can count on. Meanwhile, Ozzy Albies provided that big game-winning homer to sweep the Mets on Thursday, part of a resurgent run for him from the left-hand side of the plate. I want to leave you with this stat, and then we're going to start talking about the excitement at the end of that Thursday game because Ozzy Albies did provide it with that home run. Through May the 22nd, I got a lot of tweets about how Ozzy Albies should just give up switch hitting. He needs to stop doing it. He's batting over 400 from the right side and far less at bats, but hitting 160 with a 530 OPS from the left side and 137 plate appearances to start the year. Again, that was through May the 22nd. Well, Mark Bowman of MLB.com tweeted this out after the Thursday home run by Albies to beat the Mets. Since May the 23rd, this is 52 plate appearances. Albies is hitting 289 from the left side, slugging 600 with a 965 OPS. Those numbers, they will most certainly play, and baseball over the course of the long season typically evens out. Ozzy Albies may be stronger from the right side, a little better from the right side, whatever you want to call it, maybe a little bit more of the results that you want to see in a given smaller amount of plate appearances, but he is not as bad as a 160 hitter from the left side. He was going to figure it out, and it does, in fact, look like Ozzy has figured a lot out. Well, the Braves enjoyed that series against the Mets quite a bit. Albies provided one of the big highlights of it, but fans, they got a special broadcast in that finale that featured some former Braves calling the action, and I caught up with two of them this week at Truist Park. Jeff Francoeur and Tom Glavin shared their thoughts on that broadcast for Bally Sports. You'll hear it next right here as From the Diamond with Grant McCauley continues on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. I love baseball. Now back to more Grant McCauley and From the Diamond on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Welcome back into From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game as we continue our look at the Atlanta Braves and we're going to put a pause on going through some of the headlines of the on the field, which has been, by and large, a very good week for this club as the Braves enjoyed a long winning streak. They swept their division rival, the New York Mets. And in the midst of that series, in fact, in the finale of that exciting three-game series for the Braves, capped by yet another comeback, was a completely and totally different and unique kind of broadcast that Bally Sports brought to us that included several former Braves, a handful of Hall of Famers, and a fan favorite, and they all combined for what I thought was one of the most entertaining three hours you'll spend watching a baseball game. Chipper Jones, John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, and Jeff Francoeur were all in the booth for the Braves for Bally Sports in what was not only a well-executed, but incredibly well-produced and well-thought-out concept that I think delivered everything Braves fans could have wanted from a television broadcast. But how about this game? I don't think it could have played out much differently than most fans would have imagined when they sat down to watch just based on the starting pitching matchup. You had Spencer Strider on the mound for the Braves. You had Justin Verlander going for the New York Mets. You might have thought, ton of strikeouts. It's going to be hard to score. This is going to be a good old-fashioned pitcher's duel. Maybe it comes down to a battle of the bullpens. That's what I had in mind. Then baseball came along and told us we're not going to script it that way. Spencer Strider was done after four innings. He gave up eight runs. Justin Verlander surrendered five runs over three innings. And then we had a wild and crazy game in which the Braves just simply would not stay down. Eventually overcoming the Mets in dramatic fashion, courtesy of Ozzy Albies. Hey, how about Chipper Jones on the final call? And that'll do it. Woo! Start the buses. That audio courtesy of Bally Sports South. You heard Chipper Jones on the call. You heard Jeff Francoeur in the background. Time to pour Larry a crown. You can find the t-shirt. It's already online. But I wanted to catch up with a couple of the guys that were involved in this broadcast and really reflect on just how much fun these guys were having. So I sat down with Jeff Francoeur at Truist Park this week. A lot of opportunities in baseball are presented that you might not have expected to have. And I would imagine sitting down as a kid that grew up watching the Atlanta Braves, played for the Atlanta Braves, then you're sitting next to Chipper, Glavin, and Smoltz, guys that you did play with, but guys you grew up watching. What was it like to call a game with those fellas? It was fun because, you know, obviously when I came to the big leagues, God, man, I watched those guys have their jerseys, wear their shirts, and then you get to play with them and become friends with them, golfing, hanging out and stuff, and really getting to know them and their personalities. That's why I was so excited last night because I felt like 
you know, I, I, I can, I, I feel like I know a little bit of a way to bring out some of their personalities on air, and it was great. I mean, dude, they were so awesome last night. Chipper was so insightful, and I think people got to see another side of him. Continue to see, and I said it. He's the smartest baseball player I ever played with. So to have him up in the booth doing that stuff, I thought was outstanding. I think it's interesting because so many people know Chipper Jones, the player. He brought up Chipper Jones, the broadcaster. When he puts those readers on, it's like he turns into, like, a, there's another dimension to him. I know his Hall of Fame speech, yeah. a lot of the media that he did leading up to that, he kind of started to get to know, maybe fans did, just how cerebral this guy was. But he watches the game, no pun intended, through completely different lenses than most of us. Well, look, at, at, at the Hall of Fame speech up there, I always say Chipper's dad gave the greatest speech talking about the maturation of Chipper when he played to after baseball. And how personable he is he now, and he lets people in his life. And, you know, look, I I was there and saw it. You know, that guy got a lot of demands on him when he played baseball. And he was strictly a baseball player, but he's got off now, like you said last night. I thought he was great talking about the game, the way that they go about it. Yeah. You know, the hitting things, the little things. And then, of course, I think it's just funny when you see the blue glasses, you realize oh, yeah. he's getting a little older, too. It's kind of fun to watch all of that process yep. of his career to all of the things he does. I know behind the scenes well, here for so, the Braves working talented, with hitters. Man. Yeah. He's so talented, and whether he wants to do that in the booth, you know, I've always said it, the sky's the limit for Chip. Glavin and Smoltz, Smoltz and Glavin. Of course, you got yeah. throw Maddox in there, the phone call that came into the broadcast. Walk me through a little bit about how all of that came together and having Greg Maddox make a cameo in one of the most entertaining broadcasts well, ever. I've said it. Our producer, Gretchen Caney, was a rock star last night. She put all this stuff together. She had Maddox call in. None of us knew Greg was calling in. Uh, she put all that together. She had all those highlights and films of Chipper plowing Maddox yeah. over. You know, me and Chipper hitting the ball off Glav, and then, of course, letting Glav come back with the strikeouts on us. You know, so they, they did an unbelievable job. And we got a dream game. You know, when you looked at that game last night, I kept thinking two hours, seven minutes, mm-hmm. 24 strikeouts yeah. in a 2-1 game, and we got the complete opposite. But when we were in the moment last night, it was great to have that time again and the ability to be able to get into stories, get into stuff. And like I said, it was great because we had a lot of funny stuff, there's no doubt. But we got a lot of good baseball dialogue in there, too, I think, for the people at home from Chipper and from Smoltzy and Glaff talking pitching. Just the whole dialogue I thought was outstanding. Let me ask you from a broadcast perspective and kind of wrap it up. I mean, this was not a play-by-play, an analyst. Yeah. These were four guys who played the game, who have been down on the field, who have been through it, have been in the Hall of Fame, yeah. and have done all the different things that you guys have done. I guess where did the concept come from, and how exactly did you guys tackle all coming together to make this broadcast well, happen? Well, you know, Jeff Ginther reached out to me and had this idea, our head at Bally's, and thought, what do you think? And I said, man, I think they could be great. Because you know, it's not, you know, in football games you get 16 football games. You can't do that. All right. But in baseball, there's 162 games, so for one game to do something like that, and the the best compliment I got was from a bunch of my buddies last night that listened that said, I felt like I was at a bar watching a baseball game with four buddies. And that's what we wanted it to be. We, You know, look, there were commercial breaks. We didn't talk. We didn't tell the score going to it. We knew that part was not going to be great, but, you know, we wanted to keep the train on the tracks. We wanted to bring a different perspective, and I I tell you, most of the stuff I saw was very positive. I certainly enjoyed it, and a lot of Braves fans I've talked to certainly enjoyed it. Jeff, appreciate your time. Anytime, man. Thanks. Really appreciate Jeff Francoeur for making a little bit of time to recap what was a really fun night in the Bally Sports booth as the Braves came back to beat the Mets by that 13-10 to final score. But also in the booth were three Hall of Famers, Chipper Jones, who you still see around Truist Park. He's working with Braves hitters on a daily basis. And then a couple of Hall of Fame pitchers, Tom Glavin, who rejoined the Bally Sports broadcast this year, and John Smoltz, who, of course, is broadcasting nationally throughout the season, covering a variety of teams. But having all three of these guys back together and in one booth for one fun night of baseball, that checked a giant nostalgia box for me. So I wanted to get some insight from the Hall of Fame wing of that broadcast, Here's my conversation with Tom Glavin from Truist Park this week. A couple questions about the broadcast, because I think it's an awful lot of fun. It's kind of a reunion of sorts. I mean, you spend a lot of different time with this club, getting started as a draftee, what, back in 1984. You know, what are kind of your earliest memories of becoming an Atlanta Brave and joining this organization? Uh, Well, I remember when I got drafted, I didn't know much about them. I knew Dale Murphy and I knew Hank Aaron, and that was about the extent of my Braves knowledge. So, you know, I had to obviously... um, learn about the organization but um, I don't think it really mattered I I had an opportunity to play professional ball and and that was what I wanted so um, obviously turned out to be uh, a great place to be and and you know the perfect place for me and 
in terms of starting my career and getting to the big leagues and, and being successful. So got to believe that uh, I was where I was supposed to be. Yeah. I've talked to some guys, teammates of yours that said, you know, when you came up through the minor leagues, you guys weren't losing. So by the time you got to the big leagues, that was some experience that started to help at least plant the seeds of what you guys were able to accomplish in the 1990s. Bringing in some of the right veterans certainly helps, the Breams, the Pendletons and the likes. But what was the experience like for you going from that late 80s transitional period into a team that became a perennial powerhouse in baseball? It was a lot more fun, I can tell you that. You know, I think for for the Braves, obviously, at that time, they made a, a commitment to build around pitching, and particularly young pitching. And I think looking back at it, all of the guys that they had, you know, myself, Smoltz, Avery, Pete Smith, all of us had very similar personalities, you know, and I think that had a lot to do with why the Braves were comfortable doing that. I think they knew that we were all mentally tough, that we could all kind of endure some of the lumps and the bumps along the way and and get better and and ultimately get to a place where we helped make this team successful. And I'm not going to say any one of us in our wildest dreams thought we would do what we did, but I think it was pretty apparent late in the 1990 season when you looked around that we had a pretty good nucleus. Uh, We had some good players and, you know, all of a sudden you add the guys that we added that winter in Pendleton and Belliard and Bream and, and it was a different ball club, you know, and I think for all of us on the mound, you know, I think we were all confident, obviously, in what we were doing and in the fact that we were getting better, but learning how to win uh, is another thing. And I think having those guys behind us playing the defense that they were playing gave us all a ton of confidence. Uh, and that just translated into uh, winning a whole lot more ballgames. Folks, and on one of your teammates as part of this broadcast, what are your earliest memories of John Smoltz? Because the very interesting thing, I think, is the connective tissue that baseball often has. Doyle Alexander gets traded, you get called up. John Smoltz joins the fray the year later, but uh, meeting John Smoltz, what was that like? You know, I think it obviously for me there was a different level of curiosity because of what you just mentioned. I mean, that was my ticket to the big leagues, yeah. you know. Um, so we're, we're, you know, obviously forever linked for a lot of reasons. That's starting it, right? And so, you know, I guess there was some curiosity um, when John got to the big leagues as to, okay, well, who's this guy that I got, right. you know, essentially moved to the big leagues because we traded for. And, you know, he came in with a splash. You know, first game in New York was pretty darn good. And, uh, showed exactly why uh, the organization was so high on him. But look, it's not hard to uh, get to know Smoltzy and, and ultimately like him. He's got a big personality. Um, he's always the guy that's initiating the conversation and things of that nature. So that's his personality. And, and you know, he was a great fit for a lot of us that were on a little bit more on the quiet side. But, you know, look, he was uh, obviously highly regarded for the Braves to make that trade, highly regarded when he got into our system. And you can see all the reasons why. That connective tissue kind of goes on to your return to Atlanta. You played with a gentleman named Jeff Rancourt. You're going to be involved with him in this broadcast as well. And it's interesting that even today, Charlie Morton was a guy that came up when you were dealing with injury in your last season. So you're still kind of connected on the field up here in the booth. It's just interesting to see all the different strings in baseball, I guess. Yeah, there are. I mean, look, there's, um, you know, you play long enough, you play with a lot of guys. And some guys, <laughs> some guys you forget playing with, you know. So, but no, I was certainly fortunate in, uh, in that regard that got to play with uh, Uh, A lot of great players, guys that uh, are lifelong friends. And now, you know, in Jeff's case, a guy that, you know, lifelong friend, but also a work partner, so to speak. So, you know, it's been a lot of fun working with him. I mean, um, you know, we laugh a lot. I think there are, if you listen to the broadcast with the two of us, there are some times during the game where it gets a little bit quiet and we usually have our hand on the cough button and we're laughing about something. So kind of leave Brandon out to dry. He's on his own. But, but it's you know, it's fun. I mean, it's, um, like I said, to have... uh, played as long as I had and, and played with so many great guys is certainly a blessing. Last couple of things I want to ask you about, and kind of in the same encapsulated season, when you came up in 1987, Phil Negro was brought back briefly, and there's a video that I've seen on Twitter quite a few times where Phil's leaving the field, and there's a young Tom Glavin sitting there on the top of the dugout just kind of waiting. What was that moment like? Because again, you know, I don't know if a lot of people think about, well, Tom Glavin and Phil Negro, of course, were teammates, Yeah, but that was one of the things <laughs> in your career that has happened. It, it was just a cool moment, you know. I'm I mean, I obviously knew Phil, knew of Phil, knew uh, what a great pitcher he was and, and certainly what he meant to the Braves organization. And, uh, you know, to see that all come full circle and have him come back and, and end his career as a Brave, I thought was, A, a really cool thing for the Braves to do and, B, uh, a really cool thing for me to witness as a player. You know, you see what a guy does for a team and for a city and you see what that relationship is capable of being, you know, and, and um you know, I think I certainly watched that and was envious of the way the fans loved Phil and how that whole thing went down. And, and you can't help but look at it and say, you know what, I'd love to 
I'd love to build um, some kind of rapport or relationship with the fans in this city that results in something like that, you know. Um, it's hard to do, and not many people are able to do it, but, you know, I just I remember just being a part of that whole thing and just really taking in how cool it was that, that it was being done and it was being done for him. As it turns out, 300-game winner exits the field. Another future 300-game <laughs> winner sitting there Little on the diet. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know. Um, yeah. Let me just ask you a little bit about your Major League debut. Uh, first start for A.J. smith Shaver is set to happen this weekend, so kind of in the backdrop of that. What do you remember about yours, and you know, what advice or focus would you say that a pitcher should have on his mind when you go out there to do that thing for the first time? You know, I think for me it was there was a lot of things. Not all of it, obviously, on the game. I mean, it was... It's a surreal moment. You're in the big leagues. You're fulfilling a childhood dream. You wonder how you got here. You wonder how it's going to go, how long it's going to last, all those things, right? Um, you try to dismiss all that so that when you get on the mound, it's all about pitching. Um, and it is to a certain extent. But, look, you go. it's hard not to go through a little bit of being starstruck, you know? I mean, you're, you're on that mound, and you're facing hitters that, you know, two weeks ago you were watching on TV, you know? So, um, you know, they have history you don't. Um, so there's a little bit of that, that that you have to battle, and I certainly had to battle that for the beginning of my career, and I think most guys do. But, you know, I think the advice that everybody gets is true. It's just whether or not you can apply it, and that is you do what you did in the minor leagues to get to the big leagues. Yeah. You know, good pitches will get good hitters out at any level. The difference is consistency, you know. Uh, how consistently can you do it at this level? Because guys at this level, they don't chase balls out of the strike zone like guys in the minor leagues do. They don't swing at bad pitches like guys in the minor leagues do. It's not to say they don't. They just don't do it as frequently. So I think you can learn pretty quickly that, you know, yes, you have to do all the same things. You just have to do it at a more consistent level. But um, ultimately you trust that what you have and what you've done to get to the big leagues is good enough to keep you there. Now you just got to trust it. Well, thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. And enjoy this reunion, this broadcast, and something I think a lot of Braves fans are going to enjoy as well. My pleasure. I appreciate it. My thanks to the Hall of Famer Tom Glavin and, of course, to Jeff Francoeur for making time to walk us through what was, again, a really fun, a really entertaining, a really refreshing night of Braves baseball and one of the wildest games we may see all season long. It happened on Thursday night as the Braves beat the Mets 13-10 in walk-off fashion, and the former players in the booth, well, that was just the cherry on top, I think. When we come back here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley, we will turn our attention to what else has been happening across the world of baseball. We'll take our trip around the big leagues next, right here on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Now, back to more From the Diamond, Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Welcome back into the show. This is From the Diamond. Grant McCauley with you from the Kia Studios on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game here, wrapping up the weekend on a Sunday evening in Midtown. The Braves wrapped up their three-game series with the Washington Nationals in somewhat disappointing fashion with a 6-2 loss, but took 2-3 from Washington following up the series sweep of the Mets. And, of course, the series win over the Diamondbacks, and now the Braves are going to be heading out to play the Detroit Tigers as we continue to see every single team this year, and I believe – if I'm not mistaken, that the Braves have not seen the Tigers in Detroit and going on about a decade or so. I'll get my research staff uh, to really look into that between breaks here or maybe by the time we end the show. But uh, you may know by now my research staff is me, so I'll figure it out. And uh, as you look at some of the other things happening across baseball, I guess that was going to be my grand segue. We see all 29 teams. Let's talk about all 29 teams here on the show uh, because there is news and, and some big things that have happened, of course. Each and every week as we monitor this long grind that is 162-game baseball season, and injuries are one part of that grind. And unfortunately, for one of the best pitchers in the game, injury has been a story for him far too often over the past few years. I speak of Jacob deGrom, a longtime New York Met, multiple-time Cy Young Award winner. When he's healthy, I've said it, and I'll say it again, he's the best pitcher on the planet. But staying healthy has been a big-time problem. He went to the Texas Rangers in free agency over the offseason and signed a huge contract of five years, $185 million. I believe there's an extra mutual option on top of that that could take it up over $220 million all totaled. But Jacob DeGrom's going to have to take some time off from pitching for the rest of this year. Should be back in the second half next year as he undergoes Tommy John for the second time in his career. This is obviously bad news for DeGrom. Bad news for the Rangers, though. They have had some great success this year despite not having DeGrom as he has been on the injured list for quite some time, Texas, and I think they are a team that has staying power, both in the American League West and in the playoff picture at large. But DeGrom, though, it's just an absolute gut punch injury for him. And, of course, the Rangers, who, when they went out and did some buying over the course of the offseason to add some free agents to 
a club for a second consecutive year that they really wanted to take that big step forward. They, I'm sure, envisioned DeGrom being the guy that would lead this pitching staff forward. They've managed to do it without him, and now they're going to have to do it without him for quite some time. DeGrom spoke with reporters uh, this earlier this week on Tuesday uh, when that news broke that he was going to need Tommy John surgery again. Take a listen to a very emotional Jacob DeGrom in Arlington. It's tough, so... But, you know, I, I went through this before and, you know, know what it takes to get back. That's the goal. Go out there, you know, rehab as the best I can and and be around to help, you know, any way I can. Um, you know, we got a special group here. Um, and, and to not be able to be out there and, you know, help them win, that's, it's tanks. So this is what we love to do. But, you know, finding this out, coming here more. Wanting to be out of here and helping the team, you know, it's a, it's a disappointment. It's no doubt a disappointment for him. No doubt a disappointment for the Texas Rangers. Just six starts on the season for DeGrom. He's 2-0 and in his 30 and a third innings, 45 punch-outs, four walks. I mean, these are the kind of ratios you expect to see out of DeGrom. But as you go back and look and putting the 2020 season aside, because obviously that was a 60-game campaign and you were only going to get about, what, 10 or 12 starts. And that year, DeGrom's last 30-start season occurred in 2019. He made just 15 starts in 2021, just 11 starts for the Mets last year as he dealt with a litany of injuries over the past few seasons and now Tommy John surgery at the age of 35. I won't bet against somebody with this kind of talent being able to come back and resume his career, but this was a sizable gamble for the Texas Rangers that I think they knew going in. The injury history was there, and much like we discussed with Steven Strasburg last week, this is not an insured contract either, so... The Texas Rangers are going to be on the hook for it, and DeGrom being out for the rest of the season, early part of next season, that's going to be about $40 million worth of their payroll. But they have shown that they will spend, and they're hoping that still this investment in Jacob DeGrom will eventually pay off a little bit more than it has here in 2023. Here in the National League East, as we've talked about what the Atlanta Braves have been doing, I found a couple of interesting Phillies-related stories, and uh, one of them comes from the new rules that Major League Baseball has put in play. And this comes from Matt Gelb of The Athletic. He wrote this article this week that they have a unique problem with the pitch clock, and that is that either the pitch clock is too fast, it's not calibrated properly, or somebody is going ahead and firing off that pitch clock and restarting it a little bit before they're supposed to. And this was found out, I believe, over the course of the weekend. Aaron Nola was on the mound in 12 strikeouts, actually last Monday. Let's go back to last Monday. 12 punchouts for him against the Detroit Tigers. Well, a couple of those were on pitch timer violations, which doesn't seem altogether odd, but you look at how many Citizens Bank Park violations there are versus the rest of the league, there's a pretty stark difference. And this hasn't been some big problem where you're seeing four, five, six, seven of these things tonight. We're not seeing, I mean, the average is less than one. But in Philadelphia, that average has been just a little bit higher. So these Tigers hitters were having a little bit of trouble. And a reporter asked Aaron Nola afterwards, hey, you know, what was the secret to your success? Just a great rhythm. He had a no-hitter going into the seventh inning. So Nola said, I was, but I think the pitch clock was a little too fast. And it seems to be that way when we get back home. Well, that had been a bit of a conspiracy theory amongst people. I guess, obviously, the players are going to notice this kind of stuff, and especially inside that clubhouse. Josh Harrison, veteran utility man, says, yeah, our clock is the fastest one in the league. Caleb Cawthon, another Philadelphia Philly, said, everyone starts to feel the nuance of what an extra second or two means, and it does feel like the clock is the fastest here, but that, of course, is subjective. That's the end of that quote. So the league, of course, is monitoring these kinds of things. The Phillies had brought this up and submitted some concerns to the league office about how things were being timed because MLB is tracking all of the data related to the new rules. And according to Gelb's article in The Athletic, the league has not detected anything concerning as of yet. And MLB is rotating their crew of people at each ballpark who operate the field timing uh, coordination, or they are the field timing coordinators. And they're hired and trained by the league to execute this pitch clock each and every pitch. MLB obviously wants that to have a lot of consistency to it, because if it doesn't, then there's really no point in doing it. MLB said it would investigate the Phillies' concerns and said they found some inconsistencies with how that timer was operated and that they would address it. Uh, So to kind of wrap this whole thing up so that we can improve our pace of play here on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley, there are some nuances to how it's operated. The pitcher, once he gets that ball back from the catcher, no matter where he is, and we've seen this before, he doesn't have to be on the mound. That's when the pitch clock is going to start. But Nola said that he noticed a couple of times the home plate umpire was signaling, hey, go ahead and start the pitch timer. And he looked, and there were already a couple of seconds that had ticked away at that point. So uh, we'll see how this whole thing plays out. Obviously, by the time it reaches article status for The Athletic or any other big outlet, 
you're probably going to see Major League Baseball make sure that this is all taken care of. Another interesting uh, happening for the Phillies occurred over the weekend, and this had to do with Aaron Nola's next start. So he's going to remain in the news. Rob Thompson, the manager of the Phillies, got himself tossed out of a game because of the frequency in which Aaron Nola was tossing away baseballs. Take a listen to this. Bill Miller just said to Aaron Nola, hey, you can't keep doing that. See, this is the first time we've seen this. Now Rob Thompson's coming out. Yeah, he's saying something to the home plate umpire and to Bill Miller. What did he do? He threw another baseball out. So this is the first time we've seen anybody contest a pitcher throwing baseballs out. So what, if he doesn't like the ball, he has to throw it anyway? I, I guess that's what they're saying. It's ridiculous. Bill Miller is telling, oh, Rob Thompson's been thrown out of this game. Rob Drake's going to come down and try to help yeah, out here. Why not? Bring them all in. <laughs> well, there you hear the stylings of the Philadelphia Phillies television broadcast. That's NBC Sports Philadelphia and the uh, incomparable John Cruck. But you see these kinds of things, and you just kind of shake your head at them because I know that everybody has a way that things are supposed to be done, but I haven't seen too often that an umpire, unless we're talking about Al Herboski for the Braves in the very early 80s, I haven't seen too many back and forth about, oh, I don't like this baseball, give me another one. No, you have to throw that one. That doesn't really seem to be a thing that is done too often in Major League Baseball, but hey, we saw it over the weekend, and it got Rob Thompson ejected, so he got to watch the rest of the game from the comfort of the Phillies clubhouse. Now, something we talk a lot about on this show each and every week seems to be what has Shohei Otani done that nobody has ever done before, or at least that was borderline amazing, if not altogether absurd, because he does that kind of stuff all the time. The countdown to his free agency, though, is a topic that we've gotten into a few times on From the Diamond. It's creating all kinds of interest because how do you value or evaluate the deal that this guy could end up getting? It's going to break the bank. It's going to break records. It's going to be absolutely absurd if he is marching into free agency healthy, pitching the way that he is, and hitting the way that he is. Well, the question come up, or has come up, are the Angels going to be able to keep this guy? Because Artie Moreno's got some pretty deep pockets. He's already $400-plus plus million in on Mike Trout. Clearly, he gave Albert Pujols a whole bunch of money not too terribly long ago, I guess a decade or more ago. But who's counting? Well, maybe Artie Moreno. I'm not really sure. But Ken Rosenthal appeared on the Flippin' Bats podcast with Ben Verlander to answer the burning question of whether or not Shohei Otani could remain with the Angels, especially if we're thinking about the trade deadline later this summer. What are the chances that they realize we need to get something for Shohei Otani before he might walk away in free agency? Is there any chance? There's always a chance. And I would never put a zero chance on anything in this game. But at the same time, for all the reasons I just mentioned, they don't want to do that. And keep in mind, too, if you trade Otani... That's cutting the cord once and for all. And he's not coming back as a free agent. If you keep him to the end of the year and you mount a push and maybe even get in somehow, I'm with you, Ben. I don't see how they're getting in. But at least you have a chance and you can continue trying to court him. Do I think they're going to sign him? No, I don't think there's a chance they're going to sign him. Wow. But I don't know that Artie Moreno believes that. And nor if I'm Artie Moreno, should I believe that? I going to be confident in myself to sell this guy and what might be happening with Anaheim. The problem is Otani's been there a while now. Yeah. He's seen what's happened with Anaheim <laughs> and I can't imagine he's all that happy with it. So yes, there's a chance, but I would say it's pretty minimal at this point. Well, that doesn't sound like altogether surprising news and Shohei Otani most certainly is familiar as he has played six seasons with the Los Angeles Angels at this point, he has seen some of the ups and the downs that this club has gone through. And you have two of the best players of this generation in both the Shohei Otani show, which is, again, borderline absurd that anybody's able to do the things he does. And, oh, by the way, you already had Mike Trout at the center of whatever you were trying to build in Los Angeles for quite some time. It just has not worked out. In case you are curious, Otani, who had 34 home runs last year, and made a run at the Cy Young Award and the MVP Award. He was a runner-up for MVP. He's got 18 homers this year, hitting 281 with a 925 OPS. And, of course, he uh, is known to do a little bit of pitching as well. This year, 5-2, 332 ERA and 13 starts with 102 punch-outs in his 76 innings. This is truly baseball's unicorn. How much can he get when he gets to the free agent market? That's one question. When or if the Angels decide to trade him, what in the world could that look like? That also is an intriguing question. 
A couple of other quick little notes here as we get out of here. Congratulations to Andrew McCutcheon. Collected his 2,000th hit on Sunday as the Mets lost yet again. And the White Sox, unfortunately, had to put closer Liam Hendricks back on the injured list. This time, though, with an elbow issue. He had just come back from stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that was one of the big comeback stories this year. Hopefully, he'll be back on the mound sooner than later. When we come back, though, we're going to continue our look at other things happening in the world of baseball as I'll chat with Lindsay Barra. She's the granddaughter of baseball great Yogi Berra about the brand new documentary on Yogi called It Ain't Over. That's coming up next on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Now, more From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Welcome back into From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game, live from the Kia Studios on a Sunday evening. I appreciate you as always spending part of your weekend with me. And if you like what you've heard on the show thus far, go ahead. Head on over to wherever you get your podcast or the Odyssey app. You can subscribe to From the Diamond right there. And if you want links to all the great things that are happening on social, fromthediamond.com is where you can find everything we're throwing at you on the show, which includes some of our conversations that go well beyond the Braves and occasionally lean way on back into baseball history. I'm excited to have one of those today because I have Lindsay Berra. She is the granddaughter of Hall of Famer Yogi Berra. There's a brand new documentary called It Ain't Over, and you should certainly check it out. Lindsay, thank you so much for making some time to join the show today. Thanks so much for having me. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this documentary. I've gotten to watch the trailer thus far, and I want to chat about it because it is coming to Atlanta this week. I know it's out now in a number of different cities. It's called It Ain't Over, which for those who may be uninitiated or may just not know where they've heard it before, is one of the great yogiisms of all time. It ain't over till it's over. So I think that's a really fun title. But when I started to watch the trailer, it really stood out to me that Yogi, in so many ways, beyond what he did on the baseball field, which was, again, a Hall of Fame career, he transcended the game because of his personality, those quotable sayings, those yogiisms, and that maybe folks kind of don't realize just how incredible he was on the field. Was that a bit of a driving force behind this project? It certainly was. My grandfather played his last baseball game on May 9th, 1965, and then spent the better part of 50 years as a manager, being quoted in the press, being quoted by presidents, Mm -hmm. as a pitch man for everything from Yoohoo and Aflac to sneakers and Visa. Um, And I think there's a bit of a recency bias there. And what people remember him for is the funny sayings and the big personality. I mean, unless you're if you're if you're under the age of 60, unless your parents and grandparents have done a really good job about educating you on baseball history, you won't likely know Yogi Berra for what he did on the field. And I think that the film, you know, really tries to highlight some of those really amazing on-field accomplishments. We can go through some of them because I love to toss out the stats and blow people's minds. But also beyond the fact that he was such a great baseball player, it, it also points out that he was an even better human being, which is also very important in this day and age. Absolutely. And not a lot of people get to check all those boxes these days. And Yogi Berra checked an awful lot of boxes as you mentioned, the driving force, maybe an appreciation for some of the things that he did throughout his illustrious playing career. When did this movie get greenlit? How long did it take to bring all of this together? Because as I was looking at this trailer, I saw voices and personalities from across the world of baseball there. Yeah. So the, our producer, uh, Peter Sobolov, had the idea for the documentary in the summer of 2018 after seeing the Mr. Rogers documentary. Yeah. He uh, approached my uncles and said, how come there's no Mr. Rogers documentary, but about your father? And they said, we don't know. No one's ever made one. And uh, Peter just said, well, can I? And that was how the ball got rolling. Um, Our director, Sean Mullen, um, played rugby at West Point. So he's an athlete and a military veteran. And when I met Sean, I right away immediately was like, you're a Hollywood person. You don't know any of these sports people. And we got to get Vin Scully and Hector Lopez and Tony Kubek and Audrey Graziola and Roger Angel. And these are not young people. We've got to hurry up. You need me to put you in touch with these people like now. And that was how I got involved with it. So as you mentioned, we have some really great voices. We've actually lost a lot of those folks since they were interviewed for our documentary. Um, Vin Scully, we were the last interview that he actually did. Wow. Roger Angel was 100 years old when we interviewed him. He had covered baseball for the New Yorker since he got out of the service in 1946, which was incredible. And you look at him, you can't believe he's 100. He looks like he's like 68 years old. The man was incredible. Um, but yeah, just I wanted as many people as possible who had seen Grandpa play or played with Grandpa so they could talk about what he looked like on the field and the impact that he had on a team. 
Um, and, and I do think just the, the voices we got are really, really tremendous. And some the archival footage we got is fantastic. You get to really see what he looked like as an athlete. Um, when Grandpa first broke into the big leagues, people um, said that he didn't look like an athlete. He looked like a gorilla, a fire hydrant, a gargoyle, a fat girl running in a too tight skirt. Wow. They said he was too ugly to be a Yankee. Huh. I don't know what that even means, and I don't know who would write it. Could you imagine? No. Um, you know, he very famously said, I never saw anyone hit with his face and went out and kind of proved it didn't matter what he looked like because he was going to be terrific either way. Um, but yeah, now I'm rambling and the movie goes into all of that and everyone should check it out. <laughs> well, I cannot wait to see this movie. I'm very excited about it. We're chatting with Lindsay Bear, the granddaughter of Yogi Bear, the baseball hall of famer, the brand new documentary. It ain't over is out now. We'll talk a little bit more about it as we go along. Of course, she joins me on the waitforward.com hotline here on sports radio, 92, nine, the game. It was really interesting to see you talking in the trailer about the 2015 all-star game, because I remember this pretty much clear as day, the pregame ceremony of the four greatest living players of all time. Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Sandy Koufax, and Johnny Bench. And I thought, this is never going to make anybody happy. And I'm sure you had a similar thought. In fact, it seems that you did in the trailer. Yeah. I couldn't I, help but wonder how much the venue of that All-Star game being in Cincinnati may have played into the Johnny Bench inclusion, not to take anything away from his wonderful career. But you were with your grandfather, with Yogi Berra. I wonder if you could tell us at least a little version of that story from your perspective and perhaps from Yogi's perspective of the four greatest living players of all time as of 2015. So I was watching that at home with my grandpa Yogi and I just was like, wait a second. Um, he's got more World Series than all four of these guys combined. Yep. Um, you know, if you look at the all-star appearances and the MVPs, he's more than a few of them and 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 right up there with the rest of them. And I just thought, I don't think for a second grandpa should have replaced any of those guys on the field, but my very much alive grandfather should have been out there. It should have been the top five living players. Uh, 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 greatest living players, uh, however they called that. I don't know, whatever, greatest living players. Yeah. He should have been included in that. And um, that was actually how I ended up narrating the documentary. I kept telling that story over and again, over and over again, and, and uh, as, as proof that grandpa was overlooked. And Sean, our director, was like, I think you need to be the narrator and you need to tell this wow. story. And people always say, you know, oh, it was just that one thing. Do you think he's really overlooked? Last year, right before we... Um, premiered the documentary at the Tribeca Film Festival, Yadier Molina got his 1000th RBI. Now, Grandpa was a lifelong St. Louis Cardinals fan. Grandpa was from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He loved Yadier Molina. I wrote a cover story on Yadi when I was at ESPN, the magazine. So this is no knock on Yadi Molina. I click on the story. I see it on Twitter that he's got his thousandth RBI. And I click on the story to read about the circumstances. And the headline says, Yadi joins elite company. And there's a composite, composite image of Yadi, Pudge Rodriguez, and... Um, and Johnny Bench, who all have 1,000 RBIs, but Grandpa has 1,430 RBIs, which yeah. is the record that will no way, no how, never be broken by a catcher. And he literally wasn't even in the picture. Huh. It's like it, it, sports writers are supposed to know better. And if you don't, a quick Google will tell you that Grandpa has it the will. record for RBIs by a catcher. And I'm like, man, we got to do something to get him back, you know, figuratively into the picture as the greatest catcher of all time, because he deserves to be there. Yeah, he certainly does. And when I think of pictures of Yogi Berra, of your grandfather, there's that incredible one with him uh, holding both hands up. He's got his World Series rings on each one of his fingers. And these days, if a team figures out how to win a couple of World Series in a three, four, five year span, we're talking about the potential of a dynasty. But with the Yankees and with Yogi Berra central to all of this, they enjoy the greatest baseball dynasty in baseball's golden era. We chatted a little bit right before we got started here, but neither you nor I grew up watching that. But my dad here in Georgia was a Yankees fan because of Mickey and Yogi and Whitey and that whole cast of characters. When did you start to, I guess, maybe learn or recognize or appreciate the accomplishments and the successes of your grandfather on the baseball field? I always say that by the time I was old enough to realize my grandpa Yogi was also that Yogi Berra fella. He'd also been, he'd just been grandpa Yogi for so long that it was a hard, it was hard for me to kind of rationalize that in my brain. Sure. And even now as an adult, my memories of grandpa Yogi are making meatballs at Christmas and him burning all our hot dogs at the family barbecues <laughs> and playing wiffle ball in the yard. And then when I talk about Yogi Berra, you know, with the, 656 plate appearances and only 12 strikeouts in 1950. Mm -hmm. 
that's Yogi Berra. And, you know, sometimes Grandpa Yogi and Yogi Berra meet and shake hands in my mind, but it's weird how they kind of occupy different spaces, even though I certainly know better. But yeah, he didn't, you know, you talk about that photo with the, the World Series ring on each finger. We tell all the kids who come to the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center, he didn't walk around like that. That would have been very tacky. <laughs> yeah. He only wore one. He wore his mm -hmm. 1953 ring. The Yankees had won from 49 to 53, the first and only team to win five World Series in a row. Yeah. And that that ring has a number five on it. The 13 guys who are on all five of those rosters got that special ring with the wow. five. And grandpa wore that one his whole life. He also wore his Hall of Fame induction ring. Um, but the other ones mostly lived in the sock drawer. <laughs> that is incredible. I would think that, you know, you start to pile up a few of these things. Maybe it starts to feel like, well, this is a thing that happens every year. But I'm sure that he enjoyed the road to each one of those World Series championships. And fortunately for those of us who grew up as uh, Braves fans and had to hear about the legacy of the Atlanta and then Milwaukee Braves at that time, at least they got one over on the Yankees in the mid-50s, but yeah. Yogi and company bounced right back in 1958, so it all kind of worked itself out. But um, I asked a little bit earlier, and I'm sure a lot of this ends up in the film for obvious reasons, but what was Yogi Berra's take on his legacy, partially the way maybe people saw him, the quotability you mentioned was a big factor in that, but more importantly, kind of how he saw himself? My grandfather was the most self-assured human being you could ever come across. He was not arrogant. He was very proud, not prideful, no ego whatsoever. He, he just was, I don't think he really cared how people viewed him. I think it's um, it, the, the generations below my dad and uncles and his grandkids who are like, wait a minute, he deserves to be remembered. And if he wasn't going to bring it up himself, we're going to bring it up now. I think, you know, my grandfather's story is a, is a very American story, a first generation Italian immigrant, he volunteered to serve his country and finds himself off of Omaha Beach in the D-Day invasion. He was a machine gunner yeah. providing cover fire for our troops going ashore. And I don't think you come through an experience like that, which is an actual life or death live combat experience without a new perspective on your life. Mm -hmm. I think he was profoundly grateful to have come home from World War II when so many other men did not and profoundly grateful to be playing a kid's game that he loved for a living when so many other people had to be accountants or do jobs maybe they didn't like so sure. much. And I think he considered himself incredibly blessed and, and lucky. And I think that is the perspective that he looked at himself through. He didn't care if somebody said he looked like a gorilla. He was happy to be here and happy to be playing baseball. Yeah, and that's such a beautiful perspective. And life is an incredible teacher. And he lived a life that seemed to be packed full of events and accomplishments and opportunities that so many people would love to have the chance and would be so lucky as to learn from. Uh, tell us a little bit about where we can see It Ain't Over and also the Yogi Berra Museum. You brought that up earlier and anything else that you'd like to share with us about how you uh, carry on the legacy of your grandfather and the things that you, of course, are up to. Uh, so I'll run through that real quickly. The, the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center is on the campus of Montclair State University here in New Jersey. And um, we have a lot of cool stuff, grandpa's MVP plaques, all 27 Yankees World Series rings, lots of gloves and bats and jerseys and, you know, things. Yeah. But we also do these really incredible educational programs based on my grandfather's um, values and on, you know, with the goal of teaching a new generation of kids um, about baseball, about diversity and inclusion, about teamwork, about leadership, about treating people with respect and all of those educational programs thanks to COVID, it was the, the the silver lining of COVID for us, can be done virtually. So we do them in schools all across the country, which is really cool to teach, you know, kids in Los Angeles and Houston and Atlanta um, who may not have grown up hearing the name Yogi Berra about him and keep his legacy alive that mm -hmm. way. Um, the film is opening on in theaters in Atlanta uh, tomorrow, uh, or Friday, June 9th. Uh, it's going to be at Phipps Plaza and Midtown Cinemas and also at Barrett Commons in Kennesaw. I do highly recommend seeing it on the big screen if you can, because that uh, archival footage just looks so fantastic on the big screen. But if you can't see it on the big screen, it is also available on demand. Uh, you can buy or rent it through your cable provider or on Amazon or Apple TV or whatever. Um, and I will just say to everyone, 
wherever you see it, make sure you sit through the credits because as the title implies, it really ain't over till it's over. We save some of the best stuff for last. All right. I love it. Well, thank you so much for all the time, for the insight and for sharing some stories about your grandfather, who I only got to know through history books, through archival footage and through uh, a lot of baseball stories that were handed down to me. But it's just so cool to see how baseball connects the generations. And I cannot wait to check out It Ain't Over. Thank you so much again, Lindsay. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all the time from Lindsay Barra to tell you all about It Ain't Over. That's the great Yogi Berra documentary. It is now playing here in Atlanta. You can also find it on demand to rent or to buy. So head on over and check it out. The Yogi Berra documentary, It Ain't Over. As for this segment, it is over, but we will be back with much more as we turn our attention back to the Atlanta Braves in the week to come for this club as it heads out to Detroit. And we'll cover everything ahead for the Braves next on From the Diamond with Grant McCauley on Sports Radio 92.9 The Game. Baseball. Talking Braves and beyond. Baseball. With From the Diamond. Welcome back in. This is From the Diamond. Grant McCauley. But the finishing touches on this week's edition of the show. Hope you've enjoyed what you have heard. Lots of great baseball conversations. Of course, we give you all the great Braves talk. we got a little bit more before we get out of here. But uh, once again, appreciate Lindsay Barra, the granddaughter of Yogi Barra, for giving me so much time to talk about that documentary, It Ain't Over. Check that out. And, of course, my thanks to uh, Jeff Francoeur and Tom Glavin for also giving me a little bit of time at the ballpark this week to talk about that really fun night on Thursday they had up in the booth while the Braves were busy, having a whole lot of fun on the field by the time the 10th inning came to a close and they walked off the Mets and finished off that sweep. But now, time to talk about a few more things that have happened for the Braves this past week and get you set for what's coming up as the Braves will hit the road again beginning on Monday before coming right back home. So it's going to be a lot of back and forth for this team as they continue with no off days this week. So the Braves will be very, very busy. One man who has kept himself busy trying to turn his season around over the past few weeks is Michael Harris II. When you look at his season, just kind of in a nutshell, it has been this up and down, back and forth kind of deal, thanks to a back injury that put him on the injured list for about three weeks. Then he ended up wrenching his knee down in Miami a few weeks ago, had to play with a brace for about a week or so. But now I think he's put all the injury stuff behind him. But now the thing that he wants to get going is the bat. That has been the problem throughout the course of the season, just not being able to find the consistency that he showed a year ago winning the Rookie of the Year award. However, I think that we've seen, at least in the past couple of weeks, that he's making some serious progress toward this. Uh, Harris capped off a three-hit game against the New York Mets a few nights ago on Wednesday with a go-ahead home run. Had five hits in the final two games of that series. Has hit the ball, I think, as well over the past really week and a half. Well, probably two or more weeks going back to the last homestand when he started taking his uh, approach and applying it to go to the opposite field. We've seen a lot of good gap-to-gap power from him. Seen a lot of hard-hit balls from him. He got robbed of another extra base hit on Sunday. Did pick up another hit. So they're starting to fall for him. But would like to see a few more of those, of course. And he had a game in Arizona in which he hit the ball hard four consecutive times. And... Well, ended up with nothing to show for it, but the results as far as the batting average on base percentage, slugging, the home runs, all the numbers that you want to see from him will start to show up as he continues to utilize this approach and really get some momentum going uh, behind all of this. But sometimes not only does it take your hard work, but it takes the support of teammates and folks around you, the coaching staff, of course, working hard, hitting on the field before the game, before a gate's even open, before batting practice. A lot of these guys are out there doing all of that. After Harris hit the ball hard and just had nothing to show for it again, we call them atom balls in baseball, he had a quick conversation with a teammate of his, and it might not be who you're expecting. But you might have already heard about this this week because it's been quite a few days. But Marcelo Zuna, who knows a thing or two about struggling, well, he sought out Harris to give him a little bit of advice from a veteran player to a young guy who has had a lot of success thus far but is kind of dealing with that first long down period at the plate. Let's hear from Michael Harris, who talked to Kelly Kroll after hitting that go-ahead home run against the Mets on Wednesday about what exactly might have helped just spur him into being able to turn the page, flip the switch, whatever you want to call it, and concentrate on getting some better results. Just give all the credit to Marcelo Zuna. Yesterday I was a little down on myself, and he came to me during the game and, and told me what I can do and, and what I have done. So just, just believe in myself and, and trust that I'm, I guess, one of the baddest guys out there. And, um, yeah, that just goes to show a lot about him. And uh, he told me he told me my season was starting last, last night in my last at-bat. And ever since then, I've been having good at-bats, hitting the ball hard, and, and seeing it good. I think that's just kind of how you have to be as a hitter. I mean, we're talking about this sometimes with relievers. You've got to have a really short memory. Well, you can't carry, well, last night I was 0 for 4. The day before that, I was 0 for 3. 
day before that, I struck out three times. You can't carry that with you day after day after day. Now, you're not a robot either, so you're going to have thoughts that are going to wander a little bit. But being able to keep that approach and build that confidence and go up there knowing that every at-bat, every plate appearance is another opportunity. I mean, that's something that these players, the best players, always are going to have. When you get to the major leagues, you haven't gotten there without having some version of that and continuing to refine that. And I think it's always good to hear it from somebody else, somebody who's got the experience, somebody that's been there, done that. And I don't know that anybody has been there, done that more so. And an extreme example this season at the plate, the Marcelo Zuna, who could not buy a hit in the month of April. He was batting under 100 when we turned the calendar to the month of May. Then he proceeded to hit, what, 11 of his 13 home runs since May the 1st has been one of the more consistent sluggers for the Braves, as it turns out, this season, but certainly in the past, what, five, six weeks now, and has really turned not only his season, but perhaps his career around. That's how much Marcelo Zuna has done this year. And and sometimes you don't see or hear about the influence. Sometimes these conversations happen, and they never, you know, reach the light of day. Nobody from the outside ever knows that it goes on. But Michael Harris just feeling in that moment like he had gotten the advice that he needed at the time that he needed it, said, hey, thanks to a teammate. For helping me out with that. But for Harris, I do feel like at the plate he is starting to show some signs of coming out of things. Now, another guy, another Michael, as a matter of fact, that the Braves saw not too long ago was Michael Soroka. And this was a huge comeback story, a big one. I was very excited to talk about it on the show, most certainly, as he got that start uh, Monday before last out in Oakland. Six innings of four-run ball. Really looked like he got in trouble over about a three- to four-hitter span and then was able to kind of lock it back in. Got through his six innings. But things did not go as well the second time out on the Sunday against the Arizona Diamondbacks. It was five earned runs, four walks, seven hits, and three and two-thirds, and a lot of non-competitive pitches. The fastball was missing the zone a lot of times up, and then the secondary pitches, they just weren't enticing Arizona hitters to expand their strike zone whatsoever. And I can tell you the Arizona Diamondbacks are a team that has, I think, a very good approach at the plate. They run the bases extremely well. they got a lot of talent. And I think they got some staying power out, not only in the National League West, but, of course, in the playoff picture in general. And that really, I think, might have caught quite a few people by surprise because he expected them to be better. But I don't know that anybody expected them to be this good. And they had themselves another comeback on Sunday to continue what has been a very good season for them, even though Zach Gallen did not pitch well at all against the Detroit Tigers. It was a 7-5 comeback win for Arizona. But when I looked at Michael Soroka's first couple of starts, I really thought, okay, You have the Oakland Athletics. That kind of gets you back in the proverbial swing of things. I don't know if that's a great analogy for a pitcher, but you know what I mean. Then the Arizona Diamondbacks, that's going to be a challenge because that's a team that really uh, clearly, look at the standings and look at the offensive numbers, they're going to test him in ways a AAA offense is not going to. Then I thought you bring him back home, get him back on the Truist Park mound, let him face a Washington Nationals club that has played better this year than they did a year ago, but would seem to be the kind of assignment that you would give someone trying to work their way back into things, the opportunity to face. Well, as it turned out, that was not the case. And that start in Arizona, particularly the amount of non-competitive pitches, he only got two swings and misses in three and two-thirds innings. You'd like to be getting a handful of swings and misses every single inning that you're out there. And that, for Soroka, I think was kind of a reevaluation period, maybe for the club, certainly, but also for Michael. So when Alex Antopoulos talked to him, according to Brian Snicker, who we chatted with this week about it, Soroka understood, hey, the results weren't there. They weren't what I want him to be. They're not what the team needs him to be. So he's back down in AAA Gwinnett and continues to work there on Sunday. Six innings of two-run ball in AAA. But it's not just about what it looks like in the box score. It's And in the, in the line score in particular for him, it's going to be about comfortability. It's going to be about repeating those mechanics. It's going to be about pounding the strike zone, sequencing, and just getting the touch and the feel for his arsenal again because he has made, and if you watched him in these first couple of starts, some mechanical changes to the way that he pitches. And for somebody who was a sinker ball pitcher prior to the injury, that may have altered the general movement and at least the feel of executing that pitch. So we'll see what he's able to do. I don't know that the Braves are going to be in any particular rush to bring him back up. I think if they find themselves having a need again and he's pitching well enough, they might consider that. But at this juncture the team felt like they may be able to get what they need out of A.J. smith Shaver. And you talk about a story. 20 years old, three stops in the minor leagues, just blitzes his way to the big leagues. He came in and helped kind of bridge the gap for the Braves in that Sunday start when Soroka wasn't able to go deep into the game. Shaver tossed two and a third innings of hitless ball, struck out three. Braves came back and won on the go-ahead grand slam by Eddie Rosario in that one. 
It was a wild day, and in the midst of all of that, A.J. smith Schauber, a 20-year-old, was able to come up and make an impact there. And the Braves, I think, believe that he can make a further impact in his normal role, which is as a starting pitcher. An ERA just over one in 33 innings with 45 strikeouts across three levels would tell you that this kid has something. And he showed, I felt like, against the Washington Nationals in five and a third innings of three-hit, two-run ball. Neither of those were earned, by the way. A couple of walks, a couple of strikeouts that – he might be capable to come in and hold it down in that fifth spot for a minute. But the Braves are also hoping to have some other names back at some point. One of those is Max Freed, who is hoping to get off a mound pretty soon. He has been throwing for a little while. Uh, the Braves are also hoping to get Dylan Lee back in their bullpen sometime soon. He is also taking some steps towards you know, getting off a mound, hopefully soon. And then another name who's going to be a little bit further behind these gentlemen is, of course, Kyle Wright. So I want to catch up with Kyle Got to get his thoughts on where exactly he is because he's the one that it may be a little bit later in the season. I don't know if that means August. I don't know if it means September, but the second time dealing with his shoulder discomfort is what has him on the 60-day injured list right now. Here's my conversation with Kyle Wright from out at Truist Park this week to get his insight on what exactly is going on with his rehab on that right shoulder. Feeling good, feeling strong every day, so which is good. Like Rehab program plan has been great. So The main thing is – just literally give it time to heal and recover. Um, Corazon, I just, I mean, I guess it worked, but it didn't work at the right. same time, you know? So permanent. I think for me, I'm going to kind of stay away from those unless it's like we're grinding at the end of the year, got to finish strong. But uh, so that, I think the main thing though was, uh, you know, just letting it heal because that was from kind of talking to all the doctors that it would heal on its own. Uh, so we just need to see, let it recover, give it some time to calm down, strengthen it while it's calming down, and, and then go from there. So uh, but yeah, I, main thing is just giving it time, and my goal out of this is to hopefully it be done for good. Right. You know, what I mean, as a pitcher, you never know, but right. ideally put it to bed. So, and I think we've gotten a good plan so far, and um, you know, on the right track. Do they give you anything like anti-inflammatory wise or something to help like spur some growth and healing? And so we did uh, the stem cell, the amniotic injections, what's called, I think. So, yeah. kind of talked to a lot of people and a lot of the doctors and. You know, it kind of seems like one of those things that they say can't guarantee it's going to do anything, but it's not necessarily going to hurt. So right. it was one of those ones I feel like it's, yeah, let's do it. It's worth a shot. See if we can help speed it up and, you know, help get it stronger. So that was the one thing we did. If that's what creates the healing or if it's just the time off, the rehab, whatever it may be. But that was the one thing that we did. So other than that, though, it's just, you know, normal rehab and recovery. That is Braves right-hander Kyle Wright, who is trying to get himself back as soon as he can from some right shoulder discomfort and inflammation that cropped up on him back in January, got the cortisone shot, was on the injured list to start the season, came back, made five starts, ended up on the 60-day IL. So he's going to be a little bit of a wait before he's able to get back, but the work continues behind the scenes, and a lot of it right now, and you heard from him, it's just kind of waiting, giving it time, literally giving it some time so that everything will kind of clear up and he can get back on the mound because the Braves have only gotten 10 starts out of the combination of Max Reed and Kyle Wright this year. If that was something you told me back in spring training, I would be looking at the standings and wondering if the Braves might not be in the position where the Mets find themselves right now, fighting to get to 500 and above 500. When you've got a Cy Young runner-up last year and the only 20-game winner in the big leagues not available for you and not going to be available for a little while longer, you would kind of wonder. But the Braves have been able to show some resiliency here. A.J. smith Shaver jumping into the rotation. Jared Schuster jumping into the rotation. He picked up another win over the weekend against the Washington Nationals. So nice to see what those two guys are doing. Want to see Spencer Strider bounce back, obviously, from that start against the New York Mets. I don't know what it is with Spencer Strider and the Mets, but he has not enjoyed those head-to-head matchups. That just seems to be a lineup that just, I don't know that they, I mean, clearly, if you look at the numbers, they may have his number, but they just seem to have the approach of the fouling off pitches and really being patient, maybe working some walks that, unlike a lot of other clubs, they're able to execute it at a level in which it just kind of gives Spencer Strider fits. Uh, And then, of course, you got Charlie Morton doing what he can every fifth day to kind of keep this Braves rotation, along with Bryce Elder, rolling along until you can get a right or a Max Freed back. And as I mentioned for Max, you know, he is throwing off flat ground, doing some long toss, and the next big step for him is going to be getting off the mound. That could happen soon. Talking to Brian Snitker, now soon doesn't mean tomorrow. It just means in the not-too-distant future, Max Freed could take that next big step. But as we've talked about time and again for both Freed and for Wright, they're going to have to go through the whole progression of building themselves back up to get back onto the mound, go out and do some rehab assignments and, and starts, and then hopefully rejoin the Braves at some point. But for Freed, I would ballpark it at at least another month before we're talking about him making starts for the Atlanta Braves. 
This week, the Braves will head on to Detroit. They will face the Tigers on Monday and Tuesday night, also on Wednesday afternoon. Then they come home and get a look at the Colorado Rockies. It's a four-game series. Starts on Thursday. A couple of night games Thursday and Friday. Another Saturday afternoon matinee and a Sunday afternoon date with the Rockies. That's the next seven uh, games for the Atlanta Braves, who hope to keep the momentum going. This has been a very good homestand. It's just a brief trip up to Detroit, and we were able to confirm, thanks to my producer Dom as well, the Braves have not been to Detroit since 2013, and they were swept in that series. So maybe they can return the favor to a Detroit Tigers team that has lost now nine in a row after the Arizona Diamondbacks were able to come back against them on Sunday. That'll wrap things up, though, on this edition of From the Diamond. Once again, I want to thank Jeff Francoeur and Tom Glavin for making some time at the ballpark, and Lindsay Berra, the granddaughter of Yogi Berra, the all-time baseball great, for joining me on this edition of the show. Thank you, as always, for listening. Thank you, Dom, for all your help keeping the show going. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and we will be catching you very soon. In fact, next Sunday, that's when you can find a new edition of From the Diamond. Until then, I'm Grant McCauley. Have a great rest of your weekend. So long, everyone.